this part two of chapter 11 video, we're going to be discussing the inference about a population mean from two different populations. First, we'll discuss dependent samples, and then we'll discuss independent samples. First is the hypothesis test. You are all familiar with the seven step procedure by now. First is the requirements to test the hypothesis regarding the mean difference of matched pairs data because remember we're discussing dependent samples so therefore they are matched pairs. We can use the following steps as long as the sample is randomly selected, the sample data has to be matched pairs, in other words they're dependent on each other, the differences are normally distributed with no outliers or the sample size is at least 30. So we have to at least know that it's normal or the sample sizes are greater than 30. Also, the sample values are independent of the population. In other words, the samples have to be less than 5% of all. All right, then we determine the null and the alternate hypotheses. So we've got a null and an alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the average difference between the values is zero. Our alternate could be is that it is not zero. This would be a two-tailed test. We could also do a left-tailed test if we state that the difference is negative. We could do a right-tailed test if we decide that the alternate or the average of the differences is greater than zero or a positive value. So then we select a level of significance. Typically, it's given to you. It's usually a 0.05. And then we compute the test statistic. Remember, D is the difference between the first value and the second value. So for example, if I went on a diet and I lost 12 pounds, 12 would be my difference. Now D bar is going to be the average of all people in your sample's weight loss. Okay, The standard deviation of your sample and the square root of the number in your sample. This number is always zero. It's going to be what the average uh, that you expect the difference to be. We're expecting the difference to be zero. Now, if this number was anything besides a zero, then we would change this number right here. But we're not going to do any ones like that for this course. Then we're going to follow the student's t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The values of d bar and SD are the mean and standard deviation of the difference data. We're going to use StackCrunch to find that because it's, uh, it, it's super easy to be able to do it. Um, but we'll also do it by hand as well. And then we'll go to table 6 or whatever the table is where you find your student's t distribution. And if the p value is less than alpha, we will reject and then we'll state our conclusion. We can also do a confidence interval. A confidence interval this is going to look very similar to what we were doing up there. You've got your D bar, which is the average difference of everybody in your sample. You got your T from your T table and your standard deviation and your uh, number in your sample. So we're going to do an example of this on the next page using all of these formulas. The following data represents the muzzle velocity, which is the speed in feet per second of rounds fired from a 155 millimeter gun. For each round, two measurements of the of the velocity were recorded using two different measuring devices, like a like a radar detector. Okay? So for example, I shot the gun on the first round, one bullet, and I used two different measuring devices, measure measurement tool A and measurement tool B. And measurement tool A measured bullet 1 at a speed of 793.8 feet per second, but tool B measured it at 793.2 feet per second. Now obviously this would be matched pairs data because we would want to pair these two sets of data together because it doesn't make any sense to compare bullet 1 with measuring from tool A with bullet two being measured with tool B. 
because every round has a different velocity coming out. So that's the answer to part A. Why are these matched pairs data? So again, you're you're only letting one round go. In other words, in other words, one bullet, and it's going to be measured with two different techniques. And they will be paired together. Okay? All right. So next we're going to find the average D and the standard deviation in Stack Crunch to save time. Now, you won't have to actually do this on the exam. Uh, I'll give you this information uh, to save time. Uh, but in Stack Crunch, you could easily find the average of all of the A of the differences between here. So like, for example, if I were to write all of the differences and I could try to squeeze them in right down here just to see how it would work, the difference would be this minus this, which is a difference of 0.6. Uh, this minus this, which is a difference of negative 0.2 this minus this, which is a difference of negative 0.2, and so on. And you would have all of those data points. And then we would find the average of all of those differences. And you find the D bar, which is the average of all of those. And that's what we're looking to find for D bar. And of course, this would be really easier, much easier to do in Stack Crunch. So I'm going to switch over to Stack Crunch and show you how I do that now. Okay, so what I did is I put all of the differences in the first column, variable 1, and then uh, so I subtracted round uh, tool A minus tool B, and I found all of the differences. You'll see some are positive, some are negative. So then I'm just going to do a uh, stat summary stats by the column. I'm going to use column D which is where I put all the information, and I only want, I'm only interested in the mean and the sample standard deviation. So I'm going to go ahead and compute those to get my mean, which is 0.1166 repeating, and my standard deviation is 0.4745. So I'm going to write those down um, on my sheet now and then turn my camera back around. Okay, so I wrote down uh, what I found from Stack Crunch, which was the average difference, which was 0.1167, and the standard deviation of the difference column, which is 0.4745. So that's the information I'm going to need to plug into the formula in order to do my hypothesis test. So now for part C, we're going to calculate and, and, com and complete a hypothesis test doing the seven step process. So Remember, step one is to make sure your requirements have been met. So uh, just to speed up time, we've done this enough time by now, let's just assume the requirements all have indeed been, been met. Step two is our null and our alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the average difference is zero. We actually do have a difference. It is positive. Um, how do, does it want us to do a certain test it just says, is there a difference? So we're not stating that it's greater than or less than. We're just simply saying it's it's not zero. In other words, the difference is not zero. In other words, there is indeed a difference. So it doesn't say greater than or less than. So we're just going to do not equal to. Step three is decide what our level of significance is. And it was given to us. This time we're going to use a 0.01. So this is going to be a really tight test. Step four is to decide our test statistic, which is T. And by definition, it's D hat minus, or excuse me, D bar minus zero over SD over square root of N. So that's going to be 0 0.1167 minus zero over standard deviation divided by square root of N. And in this case, N is how many pairs there are. So 12 is the number of pairs. So even though there's 28, 24 data points, it's how many pairs? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pairs. OK? All right, so then we calculate all of that. I put that in my calculator. I get a t value of 0.852.
So then we decide uh, what our p value is going to be. So step five is determining what our p value is. So we're going to go to the t table, and in order to use a t table, we need to know what the degrees of freedom are. Remember, degrees of freedom is always going to be one less than your n. So in this case, it will be 11. So let's go now to the t table, which I have here. And what we're going to do is we're going to look up the t table of our degrees of freedom of 11. And then you're going to go across until you find a number closest to the t value, which was 0.852. Uh, you'll see that 0.852 is somewhere in between these two values right here. So that means its p value is going to be somewhere in between these two values up here. These are the proportions. So that means the p value is going to be somewhere between 0.2 to 0.25. Now recall what kind of test this was. This was a two-tailed test, which means we need to multiply that p value by 2. So that means my p value is actually going to be somewhere between 0.4 to 0.5. So it's a really large p-value. Since the p-value is certainly larger than my alpha, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in step seven, I'm going to make my conclusion. So in my conclusion, I can state that there is not sufficient evidence. There is not sufficient evidence at the 0.01 level of significance to conclude. So we don't have enough evidence to conclude this. We're not stating that this is necessarily true and this is false. We just don't have enough evidence at this time to conclude this otherwise. So there's not sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a difference. I'm running out of room, guys. Sorry, that there is a difference um, in velocity using tool A or B. Okay, so now we're going to do the exact same example, but this time we're going to do a confidence interval to prove the exact same thing. All right, so to construct a confidence interval, remember from the previous page that your confidence lower bound and upper bound are found by taking your point estimate and then we're going to add and subtract our margin of error, which is calculated by t times standard deviation over square root of n. Remember d hat, which was given to us back from StackCrunch, was 0.1167. That's our point estimate. And then we're going to add and subtract our t. This again, we're going to have to get from our t table. So let's again go to degrees of freedom of 11. And uh, we're going to, if our degrees of freedom is 11, our alpha is 0.01, because remember, it's the opposite of your confidence. So that means alpha over 2 is going to be 0 0.005. So we're going to need to know that information in order to find this t value at the 0 0.005 probability. So if we have a degrees of freedom of 11 with probability of 0 0.005, you can see that my t value is 3.106. Then we multiply that by standard deviation over square root of n 
And when we put all that in my calculator, I get a lower bound of negative 0.31 and an upper bound of 0.54. In other words, we are 99% confident that the population mean difference from tool A to B is between negative 0.31 feet per second to 0.54 feet per second. Now let's think about that for a moment. In other words, I have a negative and a positive. In other words, the difference from A to B could be negative or it could be positive. In other words, there's no telling which one measures uh, faster than the other since the difference can be negative or positive. I have two different signs for my confidence interval. Since this interval contains zero, in other words, it has a negative and a positive end, we cannot conclude that there's a significant difference between the two devices, which goes to prove what we were saying up here is there's not sufficient evidence, okay? Because the difference absolutely can be zero, it falls in my range right here. So there's no way I was gonna be able to cancel out and reject this because zero happens to fall in my confidence interval anyways. Okay, so I switched my camera over to the StackCrunch view to verify what we did here. Um, first, what I did is I entered in all of the information from tool A and tool B, and in column, uh, the first column was the differences that we already used for our hypothesis test. That's so the difference between A minus B. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, again, do our hypothesis test, which is using the T-stats to sample, but that's only if it's independent these are dependent, so they are paired. So we're going to click on the paired. Our first sample is in the tool A category. And the second sample is going to be in the third column, which is the tool B category. And then we're going to go ahead and calculate the null hypothesis uh, that the difference is zero. And the alternate, we're simply saying it's uh, two-tailed or not equal to. So when I compute this, it's going to give us our T test statistic as well as our P value, which matches what we have in the notes. We found the T test statistic to be exactly 0.852, and our P value we estimated to be somewhere between 0.4 to 0.5, and it was. But remember, you still need to make step six and seven, making your conclusion and interpretation from your P value. Now let's do uh, some inference of two population means, but this time we're going to be talking about independent samples, which would be the last type from this chapter. First of all, the criteria has to be met. It's the same criteria as it was for inference of two means from dependent samples. Those are all the same. The null and the alternate hypothesis, that again will be very similar. You got three types of tests. You can state that your mean from the first population is equal to your mean from the second population. And a two-tailed test would simply say that they're not equal to. A uh, right-tailed test, or excuse me, a left-tailed test would say that your mean from your first population is less than your mean from your second population. And a right-tailed test would say that your first population has a greater mean than your second. Of course, as always, we select our level of significance. We compute our test statistic. Um, this is going to be the difference between the two sample means. 
This is the difference between the two population means. Now we will always assume that this is zero, because remember our null hypothesis for our case for this class, we're going to assume that the population means are the same. Now in more advanced methods, we could state that the difference between these is always five or always 10 or some particular number, but we're going to assume that the difference is zero. So we will always, everything inside the circle, we will always just call this whole thing zero. In the bottom row of the standard deviation from our first sample squared divided by the sample size and same thing for the sample two. Then of course we find our p-value, make our conclusion and state it with an interpretation. So we're gonna do that on the next page. We'll also do a confidence interval using these formulas here, okay? So you got your lower bound and your upper bound which looks very similar to the information we used up there. Also, we will be checking these in StatCrunch using the stat tstats2 sample, making sure you uncheck what is called pooled variances, and I will show you how to do that. So here I've got an example. It says that uh, ramp metering is a traffic engineering idea that requires cars to enter a freeway to stop for a certain period of time before joining the traffic flow. The theory is that ramp metering controls the number of cars on the freeway and the number of cars accessing the freeway, resulting in freer flow of cars, which ultimately results in faster travel times. To test whether ramp metering is effective in reducing travel times, engineers in Minneapolis, Minnesota, conducted an experiment in which a section of freeway had ramp meters installed on the ramps, on the on-ramps. The response variable for the study was the speed of vehicles. A random sample of 15 cars on the highway for a Monday at 6 p.m. with the ramp meters on and a second random sample of 15 cars on a different Monday at the same time when the meters were turned off resulted in the following speeds. So when the meters were turned on, the average speed per vehicle was 40.6 miles per hour with a standard deviation of 10. When the meters were turned off, in other words, they could join traffic whenever they please, the average uh, speed of the average vehicle was 34.5 with a standard deviation of 9.5. So you could tell that uh, when the meters are on, at least for my sample, it did seem to increase the speed. So that does seem to be a good thing. However, it was kind of a small sample. I don't really like the fact that we only uh, accessed 15 cars in each of the samples. Being that you only access 15 cars, that might not be enough evidence, even though there is, to me, a significant difference in, in speed, it might not be statistically significant based on the sample size. And the only way to determine whether it's statistically significant is to do the hypothesis test. So let's go through the seven steps of the hypothesis test, and then we'll check that also in StatCrunch. Okay, the requirements that we have to make, we have to make sure that all of the samples are random. We have to make sure that the samples are independent from each other. In other words, the 15 cars selected this Monday are completely independent from the 15 cars that were selected the next Monday. They're not the same 15 cars. We also have to make sure that they're independent of the population. In other words, your N's have to be less than 5% of however many cars are in the country. And lastly, we have to make sure that it states somewhere up here that it is normal or your sample size is both N1 and N2 both have to be greater than or equal to 30. So since we have small samples, we have to make sure that this is coming from a normal uh, distribution. 
and it doesn't state anywhere that it came from a normal distribution. So in order to complete the project, we'll, uh, we'll have to assume that that's true because we didn't meet those requirements, obviously. Okay, step two, uh, we're gonna complete our null and our alternate hypotheses. Our null hypothesis is that the mean when the meters are turned on is equal to the average speed of the vehicles when the meters are turned off. Our alternate is to state that when the meters are turned on, those are effective in creating a faster speed than the average speed when they're turned off. So this is going to be a right-tailed test. Our level of significance, we're going to use 10%. Uh, that was not, it was given to me in the problem right there. Uh, step four, we're going to find our test statistic. And from the previous page, in order to find that, I'll write out the equation here for you. You take your X bar from your first sample minus your X bar from your second. And then you subtract the difference in the population means. Well, remember, this is always going to be zero for the sake of this class. Then we divide that by the sample standard deviation squared over N1 plus the sample standard deviation squared over N2. So this is going to be the average speed when the meters are turned on, which is 40.67, minus the second sample, which is 34, only a speed of 34.53 miles per hour. We put all of that over the standard deviation of when the meters are turned on, which is 10.04, and we square that, divided by 15 cars in that sample, plus the standard deviation when the meters are turned off, squared, divided by 15 cars in that sample. So the total test statistic, when I put all of this in my calculator, I'm going to find T is equal to 1.7. So then we go to the T table and we look up this T and we find our P value. In order to use the T table, you need to use degrees of freedom. So we're going to use degrees of freedom of 15 minus 1, which is 14. So let's go to my T table and look up a T value of 1.715 at a degrees of freedom of 14. So 1.715 is going to be somewhere in between these two values here. And when I follow those two values all the way to the top, that gives me a P value of somewhere between 0.05 to 0.10. I don't need to multiply this by 2 because this was a one-tailed test. So my p-value is somewhere in between these two values. So I need to compare my p-value to my alpha. Remember, my alpha is 0 0.10, and your p-value is somewhere between 0.05 to 0 0.10, and it's going to be in between there. We assume it's never on the end point, otherwise the t-value would have matched exactly to one of those t-values in the chart. So it's somewhere in between here, which means the p-value is going to be less than the alpha, which means we will reject the null hypothesis. So we are going to reject that the meters uh, result in the same speeds, and we will conclude that when the meters are turned on, that results in an average speed that is higher or greater uh, acceleration than those that when the meters are turned off, which means the meter, uh, the, the ramp metering is actually working. So in my interpretation, I would say that there is sufficient evidence at the 0 0.10 level of significance to conclude, and this is where you state your alternate. All right, we're going to conclude that when the meters ramps, the, the meters are turned on, it results in a faster speed. So we're going to conclude that freeway 
ramp meters are effective in increasing traffic flow. Okay. All right, so we've got one last example just to try one more of these. And, uh, oh, I did want to show you how to do this in StackCrunch, though, before I move on to that next example. Okay, so I'm going to do the calculation from the traffic metering example. So I'm going to go up to stat, and again, we use t-stats always. And two sample is for uh, independent samples. Remember, paired was for dependent samples. Uh, we do have the summary, so we're going to click on that. And this is where we put all of our data. Remember, the sample mean from our first sample, which was when the meters were turned on, was 40.67. The sample standard deviation was 10.04. Uh, the sample size, there was 15 cars. And then for the second sample, that is when the meters are turned off. The average speed when the meters were turned off was 34.53 miles per hour with a standard deviation of 9.56 with a sample size of 15. Now remember, we when we're doing these in StackCrunch, always make sure that you uncheck pooled variances. So right here, when we're talking about pooled variances, make sure we always uncheck that. Okay. Then the hypothesis test we're going to do, we want to say that the two means are equal. In other words, there is no difference or equal to zero. And then uh, the alternate, we're going to say that this is a right-tailed test. In other words, the difference is greater than zero because uh, the first speed is greater than the second. So when we do the computation, we're going to get a T value of 1.715, which is identical to what we got in the notes when we did by formula, with a P value we stated was somewhere between 0.05 to 0.10. They actually got a P value of right around 0.05, so we were a little bit off there, uh, 0.0487. Regardless, we still were able to reject the null hypothesis because the P value was definitely less than alpha. All right, we're going to do one last example from chapter 11, which is going to continue the discussion on um, finding and inferencing, in, inferring the difference between two population means using independent samples. But this time, instead of doing a hypothesis test, we are going to do a confidence interval, okay? All right, so this one states that young children require a lot of time. This time commitment cuts into a parent's leisure time, and a sociologist wants to estimate the difference in the amount of daily leisure time in hours of adults who do not have children under the age of 18 and the amount of daily leisure time in hours of adults that do have children under the age of 18. And is there a difference? A random sample of 40 adults with no children results in a mean daily leisure time of 5.62 hours with a standard deviation of 2.43. A random sample of 40 adults with, with children results in a daily leisure time of 4.1. So you can see that there is, it seems to be a difference. But the question is, is there a statistically significant difference using all of this information? So let's go ahead and construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the mean difference in leisure time between adults with no children and adults with children. Then again, we'll check in StatCrunch. So from the previous page, in order to calculate uh, confidence intervals, we first find our point estimate, which is the difference between the two samples. Then we subtract the margin of error. The margin of error is found by taking your t value times square root of uh, your first standard deviation squared over n plus your second standard deviation squared over n. So 
the point estimate we are going to find by taking, uh, we'll just use the first data point, which was this one, which is no children. So we'll say, we'll state up here, group one has no kids and group two with kids. Okay. So we're going to do a uh, daily leisure time of those with no kids is 5.62 hours. The daily leisure time of those with with kids is 4.1 hours. So you can see that there's about an hour and a half difference of additional leisure time from our samples of parents that are, excuse me, of adults that uh, don't have children. Then we need to calculate the T value of alpha over two. So let me come off to the side and first determine what our degrees of freedom are. Always pick the lower of the sample sizes. Uh, there was there happened to be 40 in each group. See here, N1 is 40, N2 is 40. If those happen to be different numbers, pick the smaller of the two, be conservative. So if this was 38, we would use 38 instead of 40. So our degrees of freedom for this one is going to be 40 minus 1, which is 39. And our alpha is going to be 10%. So our alpha over 2 is going to be 0.05. So when we find T, we have to make sure we're looking at degrees of freedom of 39 with an alpha over 2 of 0 0.05. So degrees of freedom of 39, just down here, and uh, our probability is 0 0.05. So we're going to follow that column down until we get to degrees of freedom of 39 and that's going to be right here at 1.685 will be my t value okay okay so then we multiply by the standard deviation of those without kids which is 2.43 and we will square that divided by the number in the sample plus the standard deviation of the hours of leisure time of parents that have children, which is 1.82 over 40. All right, so we put all of this into my calculator and I get the confidence interval is somewhere between 0.71 hours all the way up to 2.33 hours. So in an interpretation, I would state that we are 90% confident that the mean difference in leisure time is between 0 0.71 to 2.33 hours. Now, since this interval are both positive numbers, that means there is always going to be a positive difference between these samples, which means this group is always going to have a larger number than this group. Th these are the people without kids, and these are the people with kids. So since the interval does not contain a negative, in other words, they're both of the same sign, that means there will be a significant difference in leisure time for adults with or without kids. So I don't even need to do the hypothesis test here. I can state that I definitely would have rejected the null hypothesis that these two groups are the same because my confidence interval says there absolutely is going to be a difference because the interval does not contain zero. So let's go and do this in StackCrunch now. Okay, so I switched over to StackCrunch. So again, we're going to go to our t-test with two sample because they are independent samples with summary. And here we go. We're going to put in the same data that we did for the last example. We have uh, for adults that have no kids, they had a mean leisure time of 5.62 hours with a sample standard deviation of 2.43. 
and there was 40 adults in that sample. For sample two, that was our adults with children, and they had a mean leisure time of 4.1 hours per day with a standard deviation of uh, 1.82. And there was 40 adults in that sample as well. So let's go ahead this time, instead of doing a hypothesis test, let's do a confidence interval. I believe we only did it at 90% though. So let's go ahead and reduce that down to 90% down there. And when we compute, we're gonna get our lower and our upper bounds to be 0.72 hours up to 2.31 hours. That's a little different than what I had. Um, did I enter in all of the data correctly? Let me go back and check. 5.62, 40, 4.10, 1.82, 40. Yeah, everything is the same. Uh, just slight difference in answers. Um, obviously, uh, there's probably rounding errors in my example that I did on paper. Also, our T value might have been slightly off as well. So the very last thing I wanted to point out um, is the last page, which talks about which method do I use. And the first thing you have to address is um, what is the parameter that you're talking about? Is it proportion or is it mean? So that's the first question you always ask yourself in any of these questions is, are you measuring proportion? Is it a percent of a whole? Or is it an average, like average time being spent doing something? If you're talking about proportions, the next question you're gonna ask is, are the two samples dependent or independent? If they're dependent, you're gonna use that McNamara's um, ma matrix in order to calculate that, uh, which is not in StatCrunch, okay? So there is no StatCrunch for this type of an example. We do have stack crunch though for uh, calculating independent samples. That's how you calculate the test statistic there. Um, but we could also do that in stack crunch, which is a shorter way of obviously getting to your answer. If you're calculating um, a hypothesis test about two different means, then the first thing you're gonna ask yourself is, are they independent or dependent samples? If they're independent samples, you can do this in StackCrunch just as you can with that, but make sure with dependent samples, you select the paired two sample, where here you just select the two sample for independent. So be careful with which one you select. There are many other examples that I also have, but I think that's enough for the lecture. Um, if you want more examples, um, the lecture notes uh, with the answer keys have will, will be posted um, so you can see the answers to the last few pages of additional exercises.